Welcome um, to Translation from Outside the Metropolis. My name is Theodore Danek. I have the great pleasure of chairing this panel. I'm the Writers and Translation Program Manager at English Pen. Um, huge thank you to Sophie Wardle and the Free Word Center for organizing this panel. Before I say anything else, um, we would be delighted if you could join us later on for a focus group that will discuss um, further what we are discussing at this panel today. Um, if you would like to take part in this focus group, which was organized by Lancaster University and will take place at 2 p.m., please make yourself known to us from the panel or to Sophie. Sophie is over there waving in the yellow dress. So please join us later at 2 p.m. Okay, what will we discuss today? Um, translation from outside the metropolis. The main question that we want to ta tackle is, um, does contemporary fiction media um, need to give more representation to the rural, the regional, to writing from outside big urban centers? Um, is the rural, rural versus urban divide and the regional question, which we talk about so much in the UK, a topic in translation at all? With me to discuss this today are, from the left, Alice Conran, a Welsh writer whose, first, whose novel Pigeon was set in North Wales. Mary Ann Newman, a translator. Yes, please hold up your novel. <laughs> That's the English version. We have the English and the Welsh version. Mary Ann Newman, who is a translator from Catalan and Spanish. And Ra Page, who is the founder and editorial manager of Comma Press. I will now each give you five minutes to share with us your thoughts on this topic. Um, Alice, if you could start. Okay, so uh, um, I suppose Pigeon, uh, the book, throws up some interesting questions. Um, it's a book that um, aims to, to, I suppose, translate Welsh language experience for an English reader to, um, to give a sense of what it means to speak Welsh. Um, and it's a book that um, was brought out for the first time simultaneously in a Welsh translation. It's a book in which there is... Um, there, is, there are many snippets of Welsh, and they, these are kind of relayed to the English reader in certain ways, but it's not a problem for English readers, as I'm assured. However, I think it does throw up the problem that, um, that writers from areas that are non-metropolitan do face when they, when they try to move into, into the publishing industry, that um, we find... We find that we're working against a backdrop of a, of a, of a very strong rural stereotype. Um, we find that it's very difficult to package our work and to market it because there's a, there's a sense that, that um, rural areas of Britain are already known and that, that, that they are very, that the metropolitan reader is all very, very clear about what what they represent and therefore perhaps not interested. I think we have to consider in this argument what does metropolitan stand for? Should we be a little bit nervous of this term metropolitan, which I think speaks to a globalized, um, internationalized kind of urban center? And there's an implication that rural areas are not those things, that, that rural areas are not complicated, are not modern, are not contemporary, are not difficult, are not fascinating. Um, when in fact, of course, they really, really are. We, we don't live in Wales, for example, such a tiny percentage of the population lives from agriculture um, and has not for, for hundreds of years now. And, and you just feel that it's about time that we were able to get these voices heard across the border. So that's my Welsh take on the question. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Marianne? Well, in Catalan literature faced the, the question of the ur urban-rural divide in, when it re-emerged in the 19th century. Um, it was called the Renaissance, the Renaissance, and the, the first stages of this were romanticism, naturalism, um, a symbolism, and it was always an exaltation of nature or, or talking about the, the, you know, the, the perils of nature. Um, in the f 1906, there was a, a, a Catalan writer named Eugenie Dors who came up with the idea that what he was looking for was a new metropolitanism. And um, he called it Catalonia City, but the idea was to make all of Catalonia, even the rural parts, which were agricultural and rural at the time, into uh, 
little civilized villages. And you would do this between by getting by getting bookstores, by getting uh, libraries especially, so that any farmer could go and read poetry in the afternoon or read a manual of animal husbandry, but that everyone would have access to culture. So this was the sort of nature-culture divide. Um, and curiously, by the 20th century, by the 21st century, this has actually taken effect. I mean, Catal there isn't an urban-rural divide in Catalonia. The, the so-called rural parts are the the people who are devoted to agriculture are are actually going to the university. You know, there there are libraries and bookstores everywhere. So there isn't there isn't a divide. What there are beginning to be are third spaces that are neither rural nor urban. There, you know, where there was a first stage of industrialization that ate into to the, the, the farmland and then, um, you know, that now is failing. And so you have these places where there are low-wage workers, there are probably, there are immigrants, there are sex workers, but there, you know, it's it's no longer a, what we think of, as, as Alice said, as, a, as an urban-rural divide. Um, well, I think that's a, that's a good start, and, and with the conversation, we'll get into other topics. Thank you. Ron? Um, yeah, well, I set up Comma Press really with two two kind of burning issues in mind. One was the fact that uh, short stories weren't really being represented, or there wasn't a, real, uh, a space within mainstream publishing for short fiction at the time. Uh, a Comma Press is, uh, specializes in short fiction, that's what we do. But there was also a sense that uh, publishing was so centralized and so uh, kind of centered around London and the southeast and the home counties that um, the kind of narratives that were uh, being being sort of put forward all the time are, are kind of tested in London or tested in the home counties and then if it works with the you know within the publishing industry here it's rolled out for the rest of the country and um, the, the the landscapes and the, the cultures in, in different parts of, of England alone let alone the wider UK uh, it's, so, it's so different uh, there's there was absolutely no kind of representation of those landscapes so what I did with uh, comma originally was I commissioned writers from some of the smaller cities uh, across the north to write short stories that were set in those cities and I originally began it as a pamphlet project uh, pamphlets these pamphlets of short stories were given away free with uh, magazines in Manchester Liverpool uh, Leeds and Newcastle uh, so it was an it was a very sort of deliberate attempt to give a space or a platform for writers outside of London or outside of the southeast um, and it kind of uh, snowballed from there, really. And we were very interested in the way that uh, fiction, short fiction in particular, relates to landscapes and um, and urban landscapes. Uh, I, w I always say that a short story works better in cities because you've got very little time uh, to get to know characters. They're necessarily a little bit more anonymous. You haven't got space for backstories. You haven't got space for kind of family histories uh, and uh, all that kind of backstory baggage or character baggage which you have with a novel and therefore um, it lends itself to a sort of more anonymous kind of arbitrary encounters between characters which happen uh, more often in cities so I found found myself although I was uh, commissioning and, and uh, publishing in the north of England um, we actually still found ourselves gravitating towards the urban spaces because, as I say, the short story sort of lends itself more to those urban spaces where you get those more anonymous kind of encounters. So it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing issue, and we've we've developed a few kind of uh, possible strategies for um, the, for addressing this problem of rural representation. But but meanwhile, our our book, the City series, has has uh, gone abroad and. It's, uh, we've commissioned books of uh, anthologies of short stories uh, from uh, 10 cities so far. Uh, we did Leeds and Liverpool originally, uh, full, full length books, and then we've done places like uh, cities like Dhaka and Gaza, uh, Rio, Istanbul. So some big metropolitan literary centres, and then some smaller town, uh, some cities that are perhaps not associated with uh, literary output, like, like as I say, Gaza and Khartoum. Uh, we did a, an anthology of uh, Sudanese stories in translation last year, which was turned out to be the first uh, English translation of uh, Arabic Sudanese short stories. So, uh, yeah. 
Okay, thanks all. Um, I think before we go any further, we need to define the topic a little more. Um, when we say uh, we want to talk about leaders from outside the metropolis, what are we talking about? Are we talking about language? Are we talking about dialect? Or are we talking about um, the rural or the region, whatever the region is? I wonder what your thoughts are on this. Well, in the case of Catalan literature, it's mostly the language because there are Catalonia, well, Catalan literature is in Catalonia, the Principate, North Catalonia, which is the south of France, uh, Valencia, and the Balearic Islands. And um, the thing they have in common is the language. But there is a, the definite metropolitan pull in Barcelona, of Barcelona, um, which is sometimes resented by the, by the other parts of the Catalan-speaking territories. Um, Catalan literature right now is, is, because of the incredible work of the Institut Ramon Llull, it's, it's beginning to be fairly well represented in, in, um, in English and, and, and in the United States in particular. Not in particular, in, in England and in the United States. Unfortunately, sometimes the books don't travel from, from England to the United States or take a long time to get there. But um, the issue that we're dealing with now, I think, is now that the books exist, um, how do we get people to review them, understanding the context uh, that they're written in? And I wondered if, the, when you were talking about Gaza and Rio and all of this, if this is probably perhaps an issue also for for lesser known literatures from other from other countries. So, you know, you never see ten Catalan novels on a table together, and you never and often reviewers don't understand, for example, that uh, the, the Grey Notebook by Giuseppe Pla is a, contem a contemporary with um, um, Private Life by Giuseppe Maria de Sagarra. So, you know, what, how do we get, what, how many generations is it going to take before these books can be reviewed in such a way that, that their English-speaking audiences will understand where, where they belong? I think it's complicated in a Welsh context because we have both languages operating together um, and neither is the, the urban language particularly and neither is the rural language. It's not, it's not a straightforward division between urban and rural there. Um, I think um, what maybe people would have thought was an issue of translation, they're realising is a cultural issue beyond language now, that um, it's not just Welsh language authors that are struggling against this problem, it's also all the English language authors of Wales are having the same problem. So, um, so it, it crosses that linguistic divide. Language is an issue, but it's an issue I think which, which particularly encapsulates a problem that is beyond language. Mm. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, actually. I think um, urban spaces are, are spaces in which um, uh, people, people sort of agree on a, a, lingua, a lingua franca, um, a common language. And it, what, what distinguishes different writers and different communities is rather their, their history and their stories rather than the language which they, they maintain so, uh, so much. So I think it's... Uh, and if you, if you try and define like regionality in England according to... To its dialects or its accents or um, I think you get into very sticky water because I think you're uh, you're you're essentially kind of uh, confirming and continuing some of the some of the uh, preconceptions about those places and as, as you were saying before both uh, the smaller towns smaller cities and also the rural communities in the UK are much more cosmopolitan than we think they are um, uh, so we should have we should avoid a sort of identity politics of, of the regions. I also think they're far more challenging than we think they are. So I think I think that we um, I think the metro the metropolitan viewpoint um, has far more anxiety about rurality than we can acknowledge. So we really struggle with the idea that our rural hinterland and I speak because I'm, I'm we're all torn between this metropolitan viewpoint and and a rural viewpoint we internalize the metropolitan viewpoint in rural areas as well mm -hmm. but um you know we we struggle with the idea that our hinterland is not a green and pleasant land we really struggle with that we're not able to face up to it fully 
and, and we want we both want it to be that way and we're kind of bored by it because we don't want you know and particularly people living in urban places tend to feel that way I think one of the things we discovered with some of the, some of the books that we did in this series in particular the, the book of Tokyo was that a lot of writers when it came to the short story um, a lot of Japanese writers write about going home from their city to their, their village and uh, it's, a, it's you know the classic story of the return uh, returning to the family returning to the childhood home etc etc and it's a, it's, a, it's a slight or it's in danger of being a slightly romanticised view of both the past and home and the rural environment um, and I think we do enter into this, this strange dichotomy of the, the modern and the cosmopolitan is, is now uh, and the urban environment whilst the past is simple, singly, singular, um, innocent, etc, etc. But if you just look at like the family, your own family tree, it goes outwards in the past. It doesn't, you know, you're the, you're the end point, you're the singularity here. Uh, your past is very, very diverse, uh, incredibly diverse, you know, more than you can possibly know. But we don't have that sense of the past and we don't have that sense of smaller communities. We have this, this ridiculous stereotype that, you know, everybody's the same, everybody knows each other's business, nothing happens. And et cetera, et cetera, and it's all very innocent and charming um, when it's not. Or sinister. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the, the writers I've translated have been kind of radically urban. I've translated Kim Munzo and Giuseppe Maria de Sagarra. Sagarra was writing about the, the incredibly uh, modern Barcelona of the 1930s pre-Civil War. And when Monzo, of course, was writing about 80s Barcelona and, and the kind of flowering of, one of them was before the dictatorship and not anticipating it, and the other was after the, after the dictatorship and just, you know, when everything went, became very exciting. And um, a lot of the people who are writing now, that for a while there was a kind of urban model or mold, you know, where people, I don't know if we want to say they were imitating Monzo, but there was a lot of Barcelona-centric literature with, you know, very sexually active and things like that. And then um, now there are a lot more books that are reflecting this back and forth between the city and the and the small town uh, people, that, and which is a fact in Catalonia. People are continue. There is a relationship with the people living in the city, with the towns they come from, with the you know the the, the countryside where you might maybe you go to pick mushrooms or mm. go fishing, you know, or or your grandmother's there. But there there isn't a separation. It's a small country. You can get to wherever it is, you know, very very easily, and people do so. And that is now part of the literature. Uh, yeah, it, it's interesting though. I think also because. I, um, as in, in Britain, perhaps the countryside is a place to go on holiday to, a, a place to enjoy, not a place to work in, not a place to struggle with. Um, and and maybe, maybe that can be a problem in the way that we receive literature, I think. I think. Mm. Alice, I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about how your novel was received and the specific context that you found yourself in okay. with a novel set in North Wales. Okay, well... Um, I should say I called it pigeon partly because I knew it was going to be pigeonholed <laughs> from the outset. The character, the central character is called pigeon and there's a lot of things about homecoming. We've talked about home and rurality so I think that's kind of interesting. Um, I was aware firstly when I was writing it that I was writing into a context in which this was going to be difficult. I attempted, you know, as a fairly young writer, I sort of tr I was tempted to throw metropolitan places at it and try not to write about the place that I'm from. Failed completely. Um, and eventually um, had a complete novel. And I was told by um, people that they, that they loved it. I was told that the Welsh in it was a problem. And I was told that its Welshness was a problem. And I have been told since that in sitting in a group with other writers in workshops that, that our work would be more universal if it was set across the border. This is how deep the problem goes um, because some stories are more universal than others and Welsh ones intrinsically are not um, which makes me obviously very angry and I think is completely untrue. In fact the reception of the book um, by English 
readers has been excellent. Um, they usually get the response, their favourite thing about the book is the Welsh, the Welshness of it and the language. So I think there's also an issue here with, with um, underestimating readers. Mm -hmm. And I do worry that structurally within the publishing industry, we have a situation where you know, agents are anticipating what publishers are going to be resisting. Publishers are anticipating what readers are going to be resisting. And this means that we pigeonhole readers more and more into boxes in which they are, are not able to accept other kinds of voices. And that does really concern me. I mean, actually, I'm quite happy with what has happened with Pigeon. Parthian Books um, took it. They embraced the, the, its Welshness, brought it out simultaneously the first time this has happened in Welsh and made it a selling point. And, um, and it's had a really big cultural impact, I think, you know, in, in its own way. Having said that, it's taken a long time for any anything to percolate across the border. It was just long listed for the Dylan Thomas Prize. And suddenly people are saying, oh, you know, what's this book? Why hasn't it been reviewed? And it has been reviewed. It's been reviewed everywhere possible that it could be reviewed within Wales. It's been on every single platform. It's It's been, you know, it's made the biggest splash it could possibly make within Wales. It has done so well and it's only just beginning to percolate at all across the border, and I think that's a huge problem. That, that's an interesting... There, there, has, there have been mirror effects for Catalan literature as well. For example, uh, Jaume Cabré is very, very popular in Germany. He became a bestseller in Germany. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And he, um, as a result, his books then became bestsellers in Catalonia. And the same thing happened with Uncertain Glory by Juan Salas, as translated by Peter Bush. It became a very big seller and got really, really good reviews in, in the UK. And became and people who had never read it in Catalan started looking for it and reading it. So suddenly it had a boom in sales in Catalan, a book that had been written in the 60s. So it's curious what kind of phenomena occur as a result of, of uh, somebody else's recognizing the book. Um, yeah, I wonder if we can take Alice's experience and apply that to literature and translation. So if we think about the international context and the challenges that translation faces when um, looking at um, literature that isn't from a metropolitan area. Um, so Marianne, your example, for example, or uh, Ra, your experience with translated literature. Do we get enough um, writing translated into English from um, those who are not writing in a majority language in the country or those who are not based in the capital? I, I don't know if you want to... Yeah, I, I, obviously I think it's, it is a real problem. Uh, there are lots of initiatives to uh, help uh, the translation of, from minority languages, so that's, been a, that's had a huge effect. And we, we published uh, Empire Molina, uh, a Cata, Catalan writer, uh, but thanks, to, thanks to that. And once you get across that, that border, I think, um, I think it, a, a lot of what we're talking about is uh, problems or challenges of marketing and, and the way you package writers. And a lot of the time, the processes, uh, the challenges, the linguistic uh, challenges are not paramount in the reader's mind. Uh, uh, they're not something that general readers are, are that interested. Empire Molina's book was called uh, uh, I Love You When I'm Drunk and uh, it's a very, very funny sort of series of stories about relationships and it had the best title and we gave it a really good, really good cover and it sold out uh, like that. Uh, it did really, really, really well and every Valentine's Day it's like the antithesis of the anti-Valentine's Day book and it, and it still sells well. Um, and we didn't kind of put the fact that it was a Catalonian book first. We didn't talk about the, the fact that it's a translation. Um, it's just funny, sassy, original, etc., etc., smart. Um, and I think uh, that's, the, that's the problem, really. There's, there's so much sort of uh, in the background uh, of a book 
um, we can sometimes worry too much or think too much about the fact that it's a book in translation or the fact that it's a book from a small language. Um, it's the content, uh, really, that ultimately the, the reader is interested in, the subject matter uh, or the approach or the, the, the technique, et cetera, et cetera. So um, a, lot of, a lot of what we have to do when we make a decision about a book, uh, whether or not to take it on and also how to package it, um, how to present it is is this the challenge of just connecting with a general reader um, if you know our, our, our you know our, our Polish you know we're doing a Polish book later this year if, if we just think about the Polish community in the UK or the diaspora second generation Polish community it's far too small a market for us to, for us to make it make success of it and likewise if you're publishing from the regions if you know I'm from Derbyshire does anybody know anything about Derbyshire probably not uh, oh yeah okay um, if I just you know if I, we were presenting a book from Derbyshire if that was the you know the regional identity of the book was that all we all, all we traded on the be, there'll be no market because uh, there's about 10 bookshops in Derbyshire um, so we have to we have to find something else to connect to uh, the average reader um, and that's the challenge I agree that the, the things many of the things that challenge Catalan literature challenge all of the lesser known literatures and sometimes there it can be Polish or Hungarian I mean I think um, people don't specifically not know about Catalonia. Most of us don't know about most of the countries in the world and don't have the literary and historical context to be able to appreciate them. So there is this place where the translator's knowledge of the context of the book can should be much, very useful to the, to the publishers because we are the ones who know where the book lands in in the history what what are its salient points what makes the author interesting and i think there should be a lot more conversation with publishers about how to look for the hooks that will make the book resonate with with the audience do you, do you do you have that kind of dialogue with your translators? We, we do, we do, but it, we, there's a there's a point where we have to also have a dialogue with uh, our own kind of uh, our own team and how we present books. Uh, so it's a it's a combination of uh, obviously what what produced that book or the context that produced it is is really really interesting and, and, and vital. But then when it comes to translating that context, if you like, in terms of the marketing and the the way it's, we position it in the market um, it's a it's a, it's another editing job it's another case of picking out details or or uh, similarities or kind of uh, synergies really yeah. with with English readers mm -hmm. this, um, I, I, go for it this, I think one of the things that minority language cultures actually um, actually have that, that, that makes their work perhaps more universal and that is overlooked is precisely their experience of what it is to be minority, to be a minority. Mm -hmm. And this is, a, this is a, something that is just not exploited, I think, in marketing terms as well. I think those connections are not made. You know, that is quite a universal experience, in fact. I, I think that's, yeah. that's an absolutely brilliant point, actually. Um, often writers try to second-guess their audiences, and you get them writing stories which are, are set in some kind of mid-Atlantic, uh, kind of uh, yeah. averaged-out city, which is a, feels a little bit American, or feels a little bit British. Um, and they kind of miss it totally. And there's a, there is a weird paradox where the more specific you make a story, uh, it could be from a, an obscure part of Northumbria, it kind of gives it a, a, an authenticity or a feel that it's, you know, that it, it is genuine. Which is where it's so dangerous when we're, when we're making writers feel yeah. that they should not be writing about these very specific contexts. Yeah. Because I think you do, you go through the specific, you go through the local, and that's how you emerge at something that is more universal, mm. in fact. But if you dig down into that, it's also a very interesting because a writer like Kim Zhou, who is a very urban and very, you would think in a sense he'd been, he's been influenced by American writers, you know, and, mm. and, and of course by Latin American writers and by other Catalan writers, but, but you know, he feels very modern. And, and yet, 
for a long time it was hard to get him translated into English because there was a kind of mirage that the, I got a lot of rejection letters from, for example, from uh, Paris Review, I think it was, who said, well, there's no psychology in these characters. And why? Because they're, you know, it, as you said, they're more anonymous, they're mm. short stories, they're talking about a different kind of milieu. But in American short stories, we have a lot of psychology. And so that, you know, actually, which is one of the things that's so interesting about his stories, that this allegorical distance and irony um, was very hard for a lot of publishers to, to accept, because mm. they wanted it to be more American. Mm. Yeah, and what we get instead is a, a neutralized world literature that is set nowhere and everywhere at the same time. Yeah. Um, and the literature, literature that we get in translation that is located in rural areas is placed into exotic or orientalist stereotypes that we all recognize, but we would presumably like to see something else. Yeah, and I think, I think those exoticized, orientalizing stereotypes are actually profoundly damaging rural areas because they're unable to have a conversation with themselves either. I mean, particularly in Wales, we're protected in a, to a certain extent by the language. We have an independent publishing scene and we can have conversations with ourselves at least about what it is to live there. But I do think, um, it, you know, in, in other parts of the country, place, places are really starved of this conversation. They're unable to talk to themselves, let alone alone to metropolitan areas about what it means to, to be from that place and they're, they're having to internalize an idea of what they should be and it's vastly different from what they're experiencing every day and that's very dangerous and I think we're seeing a lot of, a lot of anger and a lot of political response to, to that situation in Britain at the moment. And I think it's, it's different if you look at uh, the English landscape and the Irish landscape. There's a lot of great writing about small communities, which I think, uh, you know, literary society in Ireland, I'm thinking of writers like uh, Frank O'Connor or John McGahn, uh, who are held up as the greatest, you know, short story writers in the Irish tradition. And they're writing about small communities. And there's no sense of this being some kind of quaint, slightly, uh, slightly innocent um, and naive kind of community. Well, it's in, in England, we've we have we've we've othered it so much that the kind of the iconic stereotypes of the small communities are horrific. They're things like uh, League of Gentlemen, Wicker Man, Straw Dogs. None of these are good uh, stereotypes to start with. It's either it's either held up as incredibly innocent or in, incredibly dark and backward and inbred and all the rest of it. Which and is also a production of the anxiety, I think. Yeah, in a way. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Mm. Yeah, and I think we run the danger of applying stereotypes from the UK to other countries, um, and especially the topic of regionalism, which is not a topic to the same extent in other countries. So in the context of my home country, Austria, it's a federalist state. Everything is kind of rural. Everyone, the biggest industry is tourism. So tourism lives off a stereotype of the rural, and the publishing houses are not all based in the capital. But if um, publishers are looking for uh, structures that they recognize from their home country elsewhere, they they run the danger of rejecting a majority of what is interesting about literature in other countries. I think that's a really brilliant point, actually. And and I think we have to be very vigilant of just, just how historically entrenched in Britain, in particular, the relationship between the town and the country is, and how that is, it is a very, very complicated relationship that has been, that has been um, made more difficult yet again by the sort of the colonial reach of the country and the fact that, that Britain has, has really displaced its, um, its idea of the country to, to the colonies as well, so that, you know, so that we're, we're now approaching um, uh, the writing from other places around the world, looking for the same kind of exotic thing that we were looking from the we've always been looking from the countryside for from the countryside in Britain, um, and then subjecting the writing of other countries to the same idea. Marianne, maybe you can provide an American perspective to this. <laughs> <laughs> In rural urban, and, and you mean it's Trump and uh, <laughs> is that? <laughs> um, well, you know, I don't. I think that there isn't really that much rural either. But the uh, the backlash in the United States has a lot more to do with these um, failed industrial landscapes 
Um, and it's curious because in, in terms of Catalonia, Catalonia and Spain, I think, you know, if you if you look at the map of Catalonia as a the, the color map of the political parties, um, there isn't a right wing presence. It's right wing presence in Catalonia is very vestigial, and the the part of the um, the conflict now that there is between Catalonia and Spain has to do with this. Kind of neo-fascist political party, the, the popular party that doesn't have, doesn't want to have an interlocutor in Catalonia. So, um, you know, I think that there are there are many different binomials involved in this. Um, and in Catalonia, you have a center-right party that's basically social democrat, social, social Christian democrat, social, and fiscally conservative, but socially, socially very liberal. And there is no equivalent to that in Spain. And it affects the literature, and it affects the publications, and it affects the way people receive, receive the literature as well. But there, once again, this, the, to the extent that you could say in the United States, you have this hinterland versus the coasts. In Catalonia, you don't have that within the country, but you do have it within Spain. Mm -hmm. If, if we just uh, grasp the nettle for a moment and talk about uh, politics, Brexit and Trump, because I think that's what's behind this question and this sense of disenfranchisement. Um, I think the, the danger is we've all fallen into the same agenda and talking the same language as the Brexiteers and the Trump, uh, Trump supporters, which is a language of us and them. Uh, it's a language of identity politics and how us, where, whatever us is, has been misrepresented by them, whoever they are. Um, it's 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 a fundamental to the it was fundamental to the Scottish independence referendum first time around this idea of the Westminster elite. Nigel Farage now talks about the uh, M25 elite. Like there's eight million people living in London and they're all horrible. Uh, it's it's just an absolutely ridiculous argument, and we have to stop saying that our identity is somehow affected by our location now. Um, it's and we we have to we have to trade on these identities and what's paramount uh, for Alice is that she's a Welsh writer or, or what's paramount for me is that I'm a publisher from Derbyshire or, or whatever it's just just ridiculous uh, and we have to look at we have to look beyond those definitions of identity uh, to to other interests and commonalities and common histories uh, which are not geographically divine, defined or uh, you know nationally or regionally defined um, and that's the only way in which we can move forward because we can't like within publishing we can't wait for the publishing industry to become kind of cellular and distributed so there's a regional kind of Midlands publishing scene and there's a Northwest publishing scene and there's a Northeast publishing scene it's just not going to work like that because of the numbers aren't there um, so we have to just change the way we talk about these things I think if we change the way we talk about these things, how can we do this practically? How can we, as a translator, writer, publisher, and me who works behind the scenes to, for literary diversity, actually work towards making the literature more diverse? Um, I kind of, it's, it's really lots of ways. I think what's, one of the things that's interesting about this is the way the word globalization has moved. Uh, ten years ago, uh, all the lefties were anti-globalization protesters. You know, the anti-globalization argument was a kind of green politics, left-wing argument. Now, anti-globalization is the phrase that's used by Brexiteers, Trump supporters. Um, and I think we, one of the things we need to do is kind of interrogate these these phrases and the language uh, a lot more and as a publisher I'm really interested in histories that are not told to us which are partly regional um, and they're partly class based um, but we just we don't really know our own history I'm, I'm in the middle of working on a book about the history of British protest and very very well educated people uh, including myself didn't know about half the protests that are coming up and like one of them is uh, the uh, the language, uh, for Welsh language protest that Ned Thomas was involved in uh, and uh, in 
that was a that was a movement which was incredibly closely linked to the anti-nuclear uh, movement and it was also linked to uh, the civil rights movement in America and there's all these other kind of links which are very very international very cosmopolitan uh, but we just don't know them because we don't talk about them uh, and it's it's dangerous that we all flock to the same narratives which are media driven uh, and London centred in that the media is based here it's not a deliberate thing but it's just a consequence of the structure of the industry um, so yeah we need to kind of reteach ourselves history I think and, and recent modern history I think we have to be careful when we're talking about um, trying to find a common language trying to find places where um, where we have things in common and, and messages that appeal to e you know each other that what we're not talking about is um, kind of railroading everyone into a very comfortable um, kind of commonality where where actually all our cultures just become kind of neutral you know preferably in the city or something because that's not that is not what we're talking about here i think it's quite interesting that welsh language the welsh language area that i'm that i'm from um, where we have a very high percentage of Welsh speakers did not vote for Brexit because we actually find um, our identity is best expressed within a multilingual, multicultural Europe. Um, so, so just because we are very um, attached to our own identity, it really does not result in, in, a, in a sense of, um, um, of otherness and othering other people. In fact, the opposite, I think. We have to know, we have to know and understand who we are in order to even begin that conversation. I was struck when I saw Fences, the, the film, uh, that we haven't really seen recently that many portrayals of African-American working class, for example. I think this, this is another time where specificity is what gives the, the, the work its richness, You're not sort of some kind of a, a notion of, you know, a general... I, and I think a lot of um, journalism and chronicles nowadays are, are telling the experience of of the sort of the the people who feel left behind you know the the p attention is beginning to be paid to the heroin epidemic in the United States for example but I don't think that hasn't quite made it into literature yet um, so you know I, I think that it is true that literature has been turning its back to on on this you know the, the writers haven't been coming out and talking about the problems that have created this radical divide between the, the middle of the country and the coast, to, so to speak, or between the, the, the white community that feels that it has been left behind and that the future of the country doesn't reflect their reality and the privileges that, that they, we, are used to having. So, you know, that is something that has to emerge in literature, but we also have to make sure that people will read it, you know, because it, you once again might have the people on the coast reading it and not the people whose lives it's reflected. It's, re it's really interesting that in the States, these stories are being told first by filmmakers, documentary makers and, and filmmakers yes. rather than writers because tradition, I don't know, like historically in Britain at least, it's been the writers that have told these stories mm -hmm. first rather than filmmakers or, you know, the BBC or anything like that. Yeah. So. Is it, is it a case that you think that literature and publishing in America is actually way behind the curve on this? It, it could be. I think it may, it may take longer, you know, for it to to percolate down into into publishing. But I think that has happened in Catalonia as well. The third spaces I was referring to. There's an incredible Catalan film. It's what, what they call the creative documentary. It's partially. It's based on people. It has real people from a from a town in it. From, but at the same time, it's Mollet de Vallès, and the, 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 off, the, the filmmaker is from that town. Her name is Neus Ballus. Um, that film has, been, has defined this problem in Catalonia in a way that the literature is taking, a lot, taking longer to do. I guess that's also a question of power structures and what actually makes it into the published form, because 
it's not enough to write about it, it also has to be published. And that's a topic that we haven't even properly addressed. But I think um, now we have to open up this discussion and invite questions. Um, we have a roving microphone somewhere. It is in the back. So if you want to raise a question, please raise your hand. <laughs> if not, I'll ask more questions. Don't be shy. Uh. Hi there. So, uh, thank you so much for this uh, really stimulating panel. Um, I want to pick up on something you said about. Could you stand up and, and sure? <laughs> I want it, to it's hard to hear you. How's that? Yes. Uh, I want to uh, pick up on what you were saying about the historical creation of our kind of image of um, rurality, spe specifically in Britain, when you were talking about the colonies and kind of exporting yeah. that rural image. I kind of think of it the other way around, that okay. our image of the rural in Britain is so defined by this need for a kind of perfect green and pleasant land yeah. to come back to, kind of in opposition to this colonial expansion, that, that we're, all, we're doing it for yeah. this perfect Britain. Yeah. I just wonder if you want to yeah, say a few words about I, that. I think you're right in a way, and um, I think we also we need, the, we need to, to think of um, our rural areas as a green and pleasant land so that we can also not really think about what we're actually doing to the rest of the world and the fact that London, say, is not built on our green and pleasant land at all. It's built on, on far more difficult things to digest um, than that. So yeah, I think, I think you're right, actually. Thanks for that. Yeah. Hi. Um, as people that work in translation and as, as translators, um, uh, today we've had the Man Booker International uh, Prize long list announced. And uh, we've seen quite uh, only three of the 13 authors that are long listed are women. Um, but at least 50% of the translators that are listed are women. And I was just wondering, in, in your work, have you observed anything to explain that disparity between the women who are translated and the amount of women working in translation? Yes. Um, so this is a huge topic for us at English Pen. Um, just to explain a bit more about what I do, one of the things I do is um, I manage a major translation grant called Pen Translates, which gives support to publishers to fund their translation costs. And we have noticed um, for years now that there's a huge disparity in applications and in wider publishing as a whole, in um, women being translated and then um, we, uh, women translators. Um, it's very difficult to address this topic without addressing publishers yourself and um, addressing the power dynamics of what goes on in the publishing industry and how publishers buy, because publishers buy from often from agents, so it's not necessarily just the publisher's fault, um, it's the fault of where they acquire and what they acquire and what actually makes it to them. So in a way we have to start with the source countries of the literature that is being introduced to them but also it's about raising awareness of what voices want to be heard and I think we can all recognize that the male story is still seen as the universal story that sells it's, even if you look at the long list of the book uh, um, th that you mentioned the books on it are often by very famous international men male authors and I've mentioned before this neutralized notion of world literature that speaks to something that we presumably all have in in common and they have seen us the male experience and obviously that's something we want to change but it's a long struggle and if anyone has a magic um, solution to it please let me know <laughs> no magic solution <laughs> Zadie, Zadie Smith said she, um, somebody asked her why she had devoted her latest novel to, to women, to a friendship between women, and she said, well, when I started writing, my models were that the important thing was a relationship between a man and a woman, and that's the novel I wrote, and now I don't have to write that novel. So. I would really recommend you seek out a, an article called Sexism in Literary Price Culture, which was published on the Literary Hub, I think, more than a year ago, and I think about it all the time. And it really it does bring up what is re what is rewarded and awarded in prices as well, and then also what women writers 
have to write about to win a prize? Do women writers win prizes if they write about women? Or do they win prizes if they write about men? And again, repeat something that is seen as the universal experience. So it's a really deep issue, and thanks for bringing it up. I just wanted to um, respond to the previous Can question. and this, Yeah? Yes, loud enough, and do a quick plug, which is to say that... Um, the, uh, are you hearing me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. better. The uh, University of Warwick has just launched a new literary prize for anyone who's not heard about it. It's the Warwick Prize for Women in Translation. Uh, it will be awarded for the first time in November. So uh, it's for a, a translated, a book that has been translated into English, written by a female writer. The translator can be a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. It's open to fiction, poetry, literary nonfiction, and children's and YA literature. And we hope to get lots and lots of entries, so please tell your publishers if you've translated a book by a woman in the last year and uh, encourage them to send it in. Thank you. And thanks for raising it again. Woo! That's the start of the magic wand. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any more questions? No? Okay, if not, then thank you all for coming. Can I say again, if you want to discuss this further, then um, please join us at the focus group um, at 2 p.m. Um, make yourself known to me. Um, we'll, this will be hosted by Lancaster University and there will be book vouchers, so do come along. Um, and thank you all for coming.